Uh, so first, I want to acknowledge that we live, work, play, and participate in a community on the unceded, ceded, and traditional territories of the 203 First Nations, along with 38 Métis chartered communities, each of which possess their own unique traditions and history here on the land that we now refer to as British Columbia. We acknowledge the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and the BC's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. In all of our work, we are committed to, to ensuring that Indigenous women's rights to health and safety and the equal opportunity to participate in a manner that recognizes and respects Indigenous cultures and traditions. Uh, it says there that I'm joining you from Vancouver, which um, the Women's Health uh, Research Cluster is, uh, their home is in Vancouver, and it's part of the unceded uh, homelands and traditional and ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. But I'm actually in Toronto at the moment, um, and that is a traditional territory of many uh, uh, nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, but now is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Uh, so I recognize that all of us are coming and situated in different lands, and I urge you to uh, learn about the traditional ancestors of lands on which you dwell now. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Women's Health Cluster. Uh, we have over 400 members, a lot of UBC, which is University of British Columbia, but many people across 18 different countries. We have a number of events, such as the one that you're witnessing today. Most of them are free. We are also running a Women's Brain Health Conference right now on hormonal contraceptives and effects on the brain. It's actually one of the most prescribed drugs, but one of the least understood in terms of their effects on the brain. So join us for those if you want. Uh, we have um, some podcasts. We have a blog. Uh, we run a number of trainee travel awards, uh, and there's very good, sometimes triple digit success rates. So please, if you have any trainees, get them to apply to those travel awards. Um, and uh, we, our work wouldn't be possible without sponsors and donors. So uh, if you want, please become a member um, and join us in our efforts to bring health, gender equity to the world. Uh, so now I'm going to stop my little um presentation about the Women's Health Cluster and introduce Dr. Karina Walters. And I'm, it's really my distinct pleasure to do so. Uh, she is an enrolled citizen of the, I was going to try and say it properly, but now I can't, Shakta uh, Nation of Oklahoma. She is a Catherine Hall Chambers University professor at the University of Washington School of Social Work, an adjunct professor in the Department of Global Health, School of Public Health, and the co-director of the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of Washington. She has over 28 years of experience in social epidemiological research on the social determinants of Nat Native American and Two-Spirit health, as well as expertise in in designing culturally derived chronic disease prevention studies, substance abuse, uh, HIV, AIDS, obesity, and di diabetes uh, prevention. Um, she has served as principal investigator on an over or uh, co-investigator on over 35 NIH studies, which is amazing enough, but that's across diverse NIH institutes and those of those 23 SPI. That is I, <laughs> a tip of the hat, more than a tip of the hat. That is really amazing. Um, so uh, she also provided, uh, prior to coming to the University of Washington, she was uh, served as faculty at Columbia University School of Social Work. Now, uh, some of you may know that I like to not just talk about people's accolade, accolades, but a fun fact. And Dr. Walters, like, your fun fact is amazing. And actually, she has two. So I might have to give both of them because they're just too amazing. Although I told her maybe we just have her back and talk about the other one. So first <laughs> of all, she was a Division One tennis player and a pro tennis player. I mean, I'm a little jealous, but I'm even <laughs> more jealous of the next fun fact, which is that she was an actress as a child and made the final two for a major movie role. Um, that and she lost out to I don't know if you've ever heard of this other child actor uh, somebody named Jodie Foster. Foster. She lost out to Jodie Foster. Uh, anyway, with that, I will I welcome Dr. Uh, Karina Walters to share your wisdom and uh, feel free to share your screen whenever you want. Well, yes, okay, thank you. Halito uh, okay. Uh, and uh, 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be here with you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, yeah, that was for a taxi driver. So I made it to this the uh, screen test and uh, lost out. And it was a good lose, uh, loss because she won the Academy <laughs> Award. So they picked the right person. Um, <laughs> So, anyways, I'm I'm calling for that for sure. You know, <laughs> no, they did. Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Um, I'm grateful for the path I've been on, so I get to be here with you all today. Um, I'm speaking to you today from the uh, Coast Salish territories uh, here in Seattle, uh, especially the Duwamish and uh, Snohomish areas, uh, people of this area. Um, I introduced myself in Choctaw, and uh, and just really really happy to be here uh, today. So I'm going to try sharing my screen. Okay. All right, do you see the correct screen? All right, awesome, thank you. Um, and today, you know, I'm I, I'm going to speak fairly, I tend to speak too, a little bit fast, so hopefully I'm not too fast for you, but if I am, just wave me down, I'll slow down. I just have a lot to share. Um, again, it's really uh, grateful to be here. Just acknowledging my ancestors. Uh, I, um, my ancestors actually come originally from Alabama, uh, Alabama area. They they uh, were part of the Moundville uh, indigenous people of uh, the Mississippian era, uh, and we later combined to form the what is now the Choctaw Confederacy. Uh, one of the things that I always like to talk a little bit about is. Um, starting to turn assumptions on its head. And I'll, you'll see, I'll try to do that today about a lot of uh, issues around indigenous women. Uh, but usually when I do research and I do talks, you know, people, are, I do, I've done a lot of urban Indian research as well, urban native research as well. And I love it when people say, oh, you know, it's so hard, you know, urbans, it's been so tough, you know, we've had, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. We've always been, you know, we've had urban societies before, you know, uh, this is Cahokia. I mean, 70,000 people live there. We had very sophisticated um, aqueducts, sophisticated, you know, agricultural and, and some of our communities. So we, we've been in cities before, but it's being in cities under uh, colonization and uh, and dealing with settler colonialism that shapes a different context for us. So uh, I'll be highlighting some of that in the impact of Indigenous women's health. Just sharing with you a little bit of our traditional land. This is where we come from. It's a place called Nanawaya, Mississippi. Um, just acknowledging with the ancestors I carry with me today, as I acknowledge the ancestors of your ter territories today, um, as we share some information uh, around Indigenous women's health and some of the models that we're we're working on now. This is just some of my family. Uh, I'm going to be sharing through four sequences. I'm going to share through the elements. I'm going to talk about water at first, and I'm going to talk about land. I'm going to talk about uh, air and wind as transformation. And I'm going to talk about fire and uh, honoring our ancestral responsibilities um, through, our, through this presentation. But first, let me talk a little bit about water. Um, and I want to start here before I start talking about historical trauma in Indigenous women, um, because uh, water surrounds our whole planet, right? The planet is majority made up of water. Uh, water uh, is mostly our bodies are made up of water. But more importantly, uh, we birth from our mother's waters, right? Uh, and, and in that way, I mean, water, we, that's why we say water is medicine, water is sacred, uh, water is so critical to our well being. But I want you to think about water a little differently today as I talk about historical trauma, too. Um, you know, what does water do, right? And D Dr. Terry Maresca actually shared this story once, and I had one of those aha moments. Um, and it's basically that water, you know, what, it, what does water do? It rises up and goes up into the heavens. And then it turns around, it comes right back down, right? So in that way, when you take a sip of water today, I want you to think about you're touching, your lips are touching the water your ancestors' lips touched. In that way, when you're taking that water today, you're actually taking in the same water that your ancestors took in. And in that way, you're, you're immediately connected with your ancestors with that sip of water today. And I'm bringing that up because it's kind of similar. There's experiences our ancestors had that we still experience today. And I'm gonna talk about that in terms of historical trauma, but I don't want us to focus only on the drama of the trauma. Um, I, I think there's been a lot of pathologization of our communities, um, you know, and you know, the Western disease model tends to try to get us to think about us as, you know, as uh, all of our problems. But I want you to rethink historical trauma a little bit differently here for today. So when I'm talking about historical trauma, I'm actually talking about power. And what I mean by power is in this moment, 
see, my ancestors, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, our ancestors were one of the original, uh, was the first group to be removed what's known as the Trail of Tears when we were forc forcibly relocated from Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and had to walk a thousand, uh, nearly a thousand miles into Indian Territory in southeastern Oklahoma. And thousands perished along the way, right? And so I am literally the descendant, our whole tribe are made up of the descendants of those who survived that trail, right? And so when I think about historical trauma and my ancestors surviving that trail, I'm actually reminded about power because in this moment, I am my great, 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 great grand grandmother's granddaughter, right? In this moment, I am my great, great, great granddaughter's grandmother. In this moment, I'm all of these things. So if I take action today for the well-being of myself and my community and my family, I'm not just impacting them. I'm actually having an opportunity to impact the next seven generations. Even more importantly, if I take action today uh, with my body and myself and my land, because it's all connected, right? I'm actually getting an opportunity to heal whatever I still continue to carry that my grandmothers carried seven generations ago. So this, uh, in this moment, that means I have incredible power. So historical trauma isn't about disempowerment. It's actually an opportunity to, to evoke our power to do something really amazing in this moment. So I wanted to throw that out there because that kind of goes in contrast to this idea that you know of, of being disempowered. We have a moment of power here. The other thing I want us to think a little bit about is vision. When I talk about historical trauma. Now, my ancestors walked that trail of tears and survived that trail of tears with a vision for me and for the future generations. They walked with a vision of love and life that I have an opportunity to now connect to through my actions today. That's, again, an important piece to keep in mind. The third piece is what I just mentioned is love. Whenever we talk about historical trauma, we're always talking about the impact of trauma and historical trauma response and all of this stuff. And that's important to talk about. But we also have to remember that they had an ancestral um, uh, transmission of love. And that when we talk about historical trauma, we can't talk about it without talking about love. The great love they held in our hearts, their hearts for us. And as we do for the next seven generations. So in this moment, if I take action, I have all of that love that I get an opportunity to pay it forward for our future generations. So that's why I want us to think about historical trauma, power, vision, and love, okay? So let's talk a little bit about uh, Native women, right? Uh, we know, and, and a lot of authors have talked about this, you know, we talk about all of our tribes have significant women at the forefront in our stories, right? Corn women, Buffalo calf women, thought women, three, you know, three sisters, all of these stories have women at the forefront. Um, and it reflects this, this sacred and central position women have always played in all of our nations, right? And it's been since time immemorial. We are the teachers of the children. We are the, we, we birth our children. We are the we're healers, doctors, mediators, counselors, even warriors. You know, my tribe, um, there's documentation of Choctaw women singing the death songs and war songs for the men as they went into battle. They actually sometimes rode out with the men and got them back out into the field when they needed to uh, with the songs. Um, we're the life givers. We're the restorers. In my tribe, for example, we are responsible for restoring uh, the balance. If something gets out of balance, we are the ones who write that balance. That's our job as, as women. Um, and we're literally these, these beloved mothers, right? Um, and with these four, these roles, we have formed the cornerstone of our health and well-being of, of, as indigenous people, right? And it's also been the cornerstone of resistance to colonization as much as possible, right? So the colonizers knew when they set foot on our land, uh, our, our territories, they knew that the best way to try to break down our societies and attack us was through our women and children. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in relation to historical trauma. Um, so destabilization of our tribes was primarily through that settler colonial contact, right? Uh, whether it, it was refusing to work with the women so they'd only talk to men and, and that established some of the balance in some of our communities to slavery, 
Um, when Native children, uh, for example, my tribe was uh, uh, decimated by slavery, the slave trade, a lot of Choctaws ended up being stolen and taken to Cuba um, uh, in, in early times um, for the sugar plantations uh, there. But they took mostly the women and children when they did that. So that kind of attack on women and children, it even exists, the attack on women and women's bodies even exists all the way to now, right? We have missing and murdered indigenous women. This, it, it continues. This is not new. It's not a new story in terms of uh, what we've had to struggle with. But let me tell you a story a little bit about healing. So our tribes, all of our tribes have stories about, uh, about power and about love and about healing. And uh, my tribe actually has a story, and this comes from Dr. Michelle Johnson Jennings and her family. And they have the story of Apanukpala, the whirlwind. And I'm going to just share this because I'm going to talk about the importance of building from original teachings and original instructions to restoring our health and well-being. And Apanukfla is a great story to start with um, when we're talking about historical traumas or any or even just contemporary traumas like the legacy of assaults on and contemporary violence on our, our communities. Um, you know, Apanukfla, she was a, a long time ago, she was an orphan along with her younger brother. And this was way back in early times. And she was an amazing hunter. Uh, she was so, so skilled as a hunter. And her brother used to try to follow along, but she just held that power. And she took care of the family because uh, that was her job um, and, and since she had to take care of her younger brother. But one day she went out hunting into the forest and she didn't return right away. She was gone for three days and little brother was getting a little worried. And then a giant tornado, something they've never seen before, came upon the people and just wiped out the, almost the whole entire village. He became panicked. He went into the forest searching for Apanukfala because she must be, you know, she hopefully she's okay. And then he heard someone crying from the top of a tree, a, a hollow in the tree. And he found her. She was up there crying. And he said, sister, what happened? And she said, stay away from me. Stay away from me. I've transformed into a spirit. And he said, what's going on? And, he, and she said, something horrible has happened. Uh, when I went out hunting, I was attacked, um, sexually assaulted by a group of men from, another, from, our, from our village, our near, nearby village. And my anger was so great. My, my harm was so great that I transformed into the spirit. And now I'm the whirlwind. Now I'm the tornado. And so I'm afraid I'm going to hurt you. So please stay away. And he said, sister, what can I do to help you? What can I do to help you heal? And she says, I don't know nothing right now. I, I need to figure this out. And so each, each week he, he brought food to her. And so she imparted to him, she said that she imparted to him all of her hunting powers. And so he became known as one of the greatest hunters uh, in the whole area. And, uh, and so he was, you know, he was a quite sought after kind of guy because he had, he had these great hunting prowess. Um, but he continued to visit his sister who was trying to figure out how to heal. But she was still ravaging ravaging villages. She was, her anger was so great to take out all the men that she could find. And so he came back one day and he said, sister, what can I do? What can I do? What do you think might help you heal? And she said, you know, I need some love. I'm feeling like I need love. And he said, okay. He said, well, you know what? Um, I, I might have, I might have a potential partner for you. And, and she said, okay. And so he did, he went to the near neighboring village and, um, uh, and uh, had met up with this other woman and talked to her uncle and they were about to have an arranged marriage uh, uh, to go ahead and get married. But he said, oh, just one last, one little thing here. I'm actually not arranging this for me. I'm arranging this for my sister. Um, are you okay with that? And she's like, okay, that's fine, but you know, let me meet her. <laughs> it has to be on my terms. So he brought her over to be Apanukfala and they fell in love. And it was through that time and that, their love that she began to transform. And she began to transform her hurt and her anger into something that had healing power and was about regeneration. And so she then passed on the story and the, uh, and the information to the Choctaw people, which was, uh, you know, her, her, uh, her anger now is not anger anymore, but rather it's she realized that her purpose is to regenerate the earth and to be able to start things over. And through that love, she learned how to start things over and make things fertile again so life can grow and people can grow. And so she turns over the earth to do that. And she said, if you see me coming, here's your instructions, put down tobacco, put out a red cloth. I will know to miss your village so that we don't, I don't cause harm because my job is to regenerate um, and, and help with fertility and the earth and help the earth heal. 
Um, so that's the story of Appa Nuthala. And why do I share that story? Because <clears throat> she's incredibly powerful, um, but she reminds us of the transformative power of love and relationality. And, the, and even after the most tremendous, awful thing, she was still able to transform that into regeneration and, and healing, right? <clears throat> so women have stories. Our, our tribes have stories about how we transform and how we heal. Um, and I just want to note, I mean, we've carried this, this violence in our lives for, like I said, since contact. Um, you know, 34% of our Indigenous women can expect to be potentially raped sometime during their lifetime. That is horrible. That is not acceptable, right? Um, and then two-spirit women, I just want to highlight in one of our studies, really bear an exceptionally high uh, lifetime sexual and physical assault prevalence. 85% of the women we interviewed um, had been assaulted, so sexually assaulted. So this violence against uh, Native women uh, is extremely high. Uh, but I want us to move away from focusing on only on the violence, but amplifying rather the strengths, our resilience, our thrivance as, as uh, women uh, in, in contemporary times. So as I talk about historical trauma, I want to shift a little bit and then talk about the context of settler colonialism, right? I've, I've alluded to it, but I want to be more specific. Um, it, it's, a, it's a different way of thinking. Right. So the way I think about it is, you know, in our tribes, we always have these these sayings. Every tribe has a saying, something like I am the land. The land is me. Quite often we have those kinds of sayings. But for settler colonialism, they'll come in and say, well, I own the land. The land is mine. Right. Very different ways of un understanding health and wellness and relationality. So settler colonialism, the United States settler colonialism is a very unique colonialism compared to other colonialisms around the world. Um, and, I, and I wanted to highlight this a little bit. It, it consists of, it's a system, it's a structure, it's a set of policies with behind that of values and certain kinds of ways of thinking um, that are totally geared towards two major things. Stealing the land, dispossessing native people of the land, um, and erasing native people ties to that land or their identity connected to that land, right? So, it's, this, it's policies like manifest destiny, doctrine of discovery, and they're all designed to distort historical realities, um, to free future settler generations from any guilt or accountability, to rationalize and normalize continuous settler rights to dispossess native people of their lands and erase us from the land, right? And put new stories on that land as if we'd never really fully existed there, right? So it's a race to replace. Uh, is, is how I think about it. And the replacement is with settler origin na narratives that perpetu perpetuate myths, right? Um, you know, it, like when we have Columbus Day here, when we used to have Columbus Day, that, at least that's going out. But that's an example. It's perpetuating a myth of discovery of America as if America was, wasn't uh, we already inhabited, right? Um, and the idea is to disavow ongoing and historical violence. Uh, it's a way of disavowing and, and creating distance from that. So I'll give you an example of, uh, of that, and I kind of alluded to it already. A lot of people don't even know how many Native people were sold into slavery. If we were to add up all of those numbers, it's about two and a half to five million Native people were put into slavery. Now, no people, no, and I'm not talking about Native on Native slavery. I'm talking about, you know, triangle trade and uh, going to England, uh, going to the, uh, the uh, Caribbean islands and, and that kind of uh, slave trade that was going on. Um, and then what is the impact on us today uh, with the settler colonialism and the erasure? Well, what erasure does is you can replace stories, right? And you can have, you can even have pretendians and fake people and all these things can emerge, right? So Eve Tuck talks about, she says, everything within a settler colonial society strains to destroy or assimilate the native in order to dis disappear us from the land, right? This is how a society can have multiple simultaneous and conflicting messages about indigenous peoples, such as all, we're all dead, or we're all located in faraway places or in reservations, and that contemporary indigenous people are less indigenous or, than prior you know, prior generations, or you know, everyone's just a little bit in, in native, right? So it's all of those kinds of conversations. And what, what those do, do, they produce a erasure and invisibility for our communities. Um, but historically trauma, historical trauma events, however, so this is a part that isn't always clear in the literature. People kind of reference settler colonialism, but they don't really make the link to how it's tied to historical trauma. Well, historically traumatic events are the events that uphold settler colonial structures. These events uphold settler systems, 
Okay, so they, they, you know, you've got manifest destiny. Well, that gives you the, you know, that set the stage for land dispossession, right? So these settler colonial structures and policies, but you also have historically traumatic events to uphold them. These events are designed to do actually four things. I, I, I should update this slide. Um, they're designed to eradicate a people through genocide, straight out genocide, right? Uh, eradicate our life ways. That would be like boarding school is a good example of that, eradicating our culture, uh, trying to eradicate our, uh, our ceremonies, our, our, our um, identity, our languages. Eradicate our thought ways. That's, so the, the life, life ways is a form of ethnocide. Thought ways is a form of epistemocide, how we think and talk about ourselves, right? Our epistemologies, our worldviews, trying to disrupt those. The fourth one is the ecocide, right? To eradicate um, land or take land or, you know, uh, pollute land or hurt land um, as a way to um, get at native people. So that's a form of ecocide. Um, and this, this, these kinds of events tied to these things are conceptualized as a collective trauma that we all we all feel it even if we don't directly feel it. Um, and I wanna acknowledge that just because we've had these historically traumatic events like the forced removal of my tribe, doesn't mean we all do poorly, right? In fact, the majority of, majority of us do incredibly well despite these events, right? That we have had some, some uh, factors that have protected us. And usually those factors are, called, you know, our culture has protected us, our spiritual ways have protected us. You know, our grandmothers protected us. There's ways that our, our communities have protected us. So I want to acknowledge that. So just some examples of historically traumatic is, of course, boarding school experience or residential school in Canada. Um, you know, the erasure of indigeneity and the attempt to kill the Indian and save man. But for women, um, there was a very concerted effort to replace matriarchy with patriarchy, where a lot of our societies were matrilineal. And there, through Christianity, there was a very clear indoctrination to uh, have men become heads and very individualistic, um, you know, family heads and not seen as part of the larger culture and, and, and society. Um, so that, that shifted um, some of those important relationships and actually shifted women's power. Um, as for example, we say with green corn ceremony started going away, women started losing their power because we were in charge of the economy. We were in charge of the land. Uh, you know, when we got tired of if our, if our man, you know, was acting out, we just put his moccasins outside the door and he had to go back home to mama. We still kept the land and it was our resources, but all of that started to shift with the advent of Christianity. I had a chance to look at some of the, some old Choctaw newspapers at the turn of the, uh, right after uh, Trail of Tears happened. It, that's when you saw a big conversion to try to get women to roll into this very uh, patriarchal version. And there was actually written by a Choctaw man uh, a series of articles that were written about how to be a good Choctaw woman. And it was all about being subservient to men. It was all about like real, real uh, status and, and, and role shift um, that started to get hammered in post, post removal. Um, okay, yeah, so we've, we've seen some of these impacts. And, and just so you know, this is actually, there's evidence that supports this, the research that we've done. Um, and basically we've seen after control, so you know, the big argument is, and I've had this from other native researchers, they said, well, hey, wait a minute, maybe these historically traumatic events don't really impact us. Um, uh, it, once you weigh in the level of contemporary sexual assaults and violent assaults on our people, that takes, that's probably the majority of what's causing or driving PTSD and other things this historical trauma is probably too far away for it to have an impact. Now, I would say, I, I would say that that, uh, I think it's more complex than that. I would say that these two things interact to produce health and wellness for our communities now. And some of our research shows that. So we actually wanted to see the impact of intergenerational trauma and also the chronicity of event exposure, like the number of events your ancestors experienced. Did that have an impact on contemporary PTSD and substance use, right? And so what we did is statistically, we literally controlled for um, you know, one's own military combat exposure, because that could predict PTSD, one's own lifetime and uh, sexual and physical assaults, one's own um, own historically traumatic experiences done in this generation. We controlled for all of those to see, is there still an impact of what happened to your great-grandparents on your well-being now? And sure enough, we found out that it, that's true. So, PT, so uh, historical trauma was related to PTSD and substance use. And actually land-based trauma was also related to uh, mental health outcomes, like uh, even attacks on the land was a major factor. But despite all this, uh, you know, we've survived and women still play incredibly important roles in our communities. 
and we're still here. But I wanted to point out just the one thing to keep in mind. Well, what is the impact of these historically traumatic events on our well-being um, collectively and all the way down to individually? It, it, these, remember, these events are designed to do three major things. They're designed to, if, if we survive it, <laughs> designed to disrupt our ability to fulfill our original instructions. Creator, all of us has, has been given instructions about how to live as good people, how to become a good human being. And, and those instructions are, are where our values and, and how we are given uh, ways of living that's healthy and well. So these, it, these events are designed to disrupt our ability to fulfill those, right? So when General Sheridan killed all the buffalo for the giant buffalo kills that happened in the 1800s, it wasn't about just interrupting a food source. It was about interrupting uh, uh, the Lakota and Dakota and Dakota people's ability to fulfill their original instructions to Buffalo Nation. It was a spiritual assault, right? So that's, those are original instructions are really critical. The, it's also designed to disrupt our relational ways of being in the world, how we relate our, our connection to our ancestors, our connection to past generations, our connection to our bodies even, right? So it, it, it causes relational ways of being, disruptions in that. It's also designed to disrupt how we think and talk about ourselves, how we story our lives, right? If we internalize colonial messages and we start storing our lives according to how settler colonial people would like us to be. And that's not healthy for us. So those, those three elements get impacted. So the interventions we design at the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute always focuses on those three elements. Building our interventions and health promotion activities through restoring original, like growing from original instructions. All of our activities are about restoring relational ways of being in this world and restoring and narrating our lives in a helpful way. Um, that's designed and connected to our original, our original teachings. It's really important. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so just to give you a brief example, I'm checking my time, on original instructions. Um, in my tribe, we have a story about Hashkanaya, the moon, Hashi, the moon. Um, so long time ago, back when, it, I'm going to give you the comic book version. A uh, long time, so uh, the moon and sun, uh, son was a man, shared the nights, uh, shared the sky together, and it was all bright. And they shared the sky with their star children, all their star children. And they had a beautiful, enjoyable family time up there in, in, in the star world. But when, you know, one day, you know, son tends to send its sun flares out once in a while. And Hashkanaya said, you know, if any of those flares ever hit us or any of my children, we're going to move to the other side of the world. And, ha and uh, uh, Hashali said, no, 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 you don't have to worry about that. That's not going to happen. She said, well, I'm just telling you, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the deal. But of course, what happened? One day, Hashali got a little, woo, got a little flurry, and one sparked off and hit, hit Moon. She gathered her children. She cried. She said, I have to do this. I'm leaving. He begged her to stay. And she said, no, I have to move to the other side of the world now. And she said, but every once a month, I'll meet you. I love you. I will still have a conversation. It'll only be once a month. We'll, we'll share the morning sky together. One time a month, we can have that conversation. But I, th this, is, this is what must happen. So she moved with all her star children to the other side. So that's why we have darkness. So we had domestic violence prevention as part of our original teachings. We understood what the consequences were if you did not behave well with each other. So, and, and the women, the woman had the authority to control her family system. Uh, so that's an example of how we would use an original instruction, an original teaching that can get us to like domestic violence prevention with, with our communities. All of our stories, you know, children's stories even have these, these ways of thinking about it. Um, another one would be uh, uh, in terms of relational restoration, um, you know, restoring relational ways of thinking. So I'll give you an example of uh, when I was doing clinical work, um, Eduardo Duran did, uh, did, some did some supervising of my early career and, and when I was doing clinical work. And he shared a story with me that, that really stuck with me that helped me um, think about relational ways of being in the world and restoring that. Um, so people who've been in systems for a really long time, who become good clients, in mental health systems, quite often they talk about themselves in their disease states, right? So you say, I'm diabetic, I'm alcoholic, 
I am my disease. And isn't it interesting? We only do this mostly around behavioral health, uh, behaviorally oriented diseases. We don't say it like with cancer, unless that's your zodiac sign, right? I was saying I'm cancer, unless it's, you know. So, but we tend to do it with things that quite often are tied to more behavioral patterns um, and tend to really pathologize our community. So, um, so good clients in these systems quite often get socialized into becoming their disease, literally talking about themselves as a disease state. So part of the decolonizing work in, that we do in relational ways of you know, restoring our way of thinking is you challenge that. And you begin to think about your relationship to uh, this uh, uh, health condition that you're, you're struggling with. So it's your person living with, or, you know, but when you live with something, right, you have a relationship. So for example, a person will come in and let's say this woman comes in and she says, oh, I, I'm, you know, I say, hey, how's you, how are you doing? And they, you know, uh, you know, uh, LaDonna, how are you doing today? You know, and she'll say, oh, you know, I'll say, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. And she'll say, oh, I'm depressed. So Ed would say something like, well, so tell me about that naming ceremony when your mother named you depressed. And she'd be like, what are you talking about? Getting to, re to kind of think about it. I didn't have a naming ceremony. What are, you, what are you talking about? I just said I'm depressed. And I said, well, yes, you're saying you're depressed. So that's your name. So let me understand how you received that name. Um, and why is that important? Because from Native people, when we receive our names, culturally and spiritually, it provides protocols by which we conduct ourselves in the world. It also provides protocols by which the community receives us and sees us. It provides pro protocols for how um, what what uh, what our uh, authority is in moving, what our agency is, and what we're supposed to be doing in the world. So receiving a name is actually very powerful. She hadn't even thought that she's received this name, depression. And what does that mean to her? So part of the decolonizing work is begin to say, okay, well, if you're you're not, if you didn't receive this, you know, it kind of seems like let's talk about how you receive that name. You know, group of social workers and psychologists and maybe psychiatrists was in there, but you know, they all got together and probably around a, a square table most likely and had this big, uh, big, uh, you know, discussion. This very sacred discussion. They brought out this very, very important sacred text called the DSM five. And, you know, over that DSM-5, they opened up that page and they said, oh, your name shall be depressed. Is that what happened? <laughs> so you offer a little humor, right? Humor is medicine, right? And then you might shift the conversation a little bit, say, well, tell me when this depression visits you. Now you're starting to get into relational way of thinking that you are not the depression. The depression is something that visits upon you. It wakes you up at night. It talks to you, you know, and if you have a relationship with this, what can you do? If you have a relationship with something, you can leave it. You can break up. You can put boundaries around it. So that's these are just examples of how you begin to shift it to a relational way of thinking um, and, and start that decolonizing process. And that leads, obviously, to narrative transformation, right? You begin to store your life a little bit differently. You begin to just talk about yourself a little bit differently. And that's really, really important. So let me tell you about how I, I, so that was all my background. I did this clinical work. I did a lot of research, early work on focusing a lot on Native women, on, on historical trauma. But I had kind of an aha moment that, you know, and I, Susan Yellow Horses once said to me a long time ago when we first started this work, she said, well, how do we transcend this? You know, we need to transcend this. We can't keep just spinning ourselves around historical trauma. How do we transcend this? And I started really, uh, really thinking about how I can move forward in a beautiful direction. And I was actually inspired by a Native Hawaiian elder when I heard him talk about um, crabs in a bucket. And you know crabs, I don't know if you guys have that saying up in Canada, but crabs in a bucket here basically is used as an example of lateral violence. You know, So what fishermen do is they put grabs, crabs into a bucket and when crab tries to crawl out, the other crabs will pull it back down, right? And we kind of accept that as a conversation around lateral violence. And you know, if I was a social worker crab in that bucket, I'd be all like, let's lift each other up, crabs. Let's organize. We can do this, you know. Um, you know, why are you keep pulling down? Let's let's look, take a look at that. You know, I mean, I would be like doing some crazy, you know, that's where mine would go. And but, you know, uh, Kei Kailoa said, is this natural crab behavior? I'm like, wait, what? Is this how crabs normally behave? Uh, like, why did we accept this as crab behavior? And I was like, huh, let me think about that. How, how do crabs behave? He said, you know what crabs really do? When they're in their natural, healthy environment, 
They lift each other up onto the rocks. They help each other up onto the rocks. That's natural crab behavior. The bucket changed their behavior. Why do we accept all of our interventions having to be within the bucket? If we can restore a healthy environment, healthy behavior emerges. And that made me go, oh, wow. We need to work on building not just it's good to have interventions that help the individual and families and communities, especially when we're in an urgent situation, right? Immediate trauma, you need to deal with that. But we need to create a healthy environment for our healthful behaviors to emerge. And when we accept the bucket, we're accepting historical trauma and settler colonialism is defining our behavior. And he, he said, bust out of that bucket. We need to bust out of that bucket or I'm saying we need to bust out of that bucket and begin to create uh, new models and new ways of looking at creating sustainable health solutions for women, children, and families and communities that are by our community, that are grown from our original instructions, and that can be sustainable. And we need to get out of service thinking. We've, we've been socialized to think the way we find solutions is through services, because that's where we, the dollars come trickle down through, right? And I understand that. But when we accept the service thinking, we're accepting a bucket. We're not really beginning to think outside of that bucket for producing really, really, truly community sustainable change. Services are important. So I'm not saying there's a problem, but we can't put all our eggs in that basket if we're going to really affect population health, if we're going to really affect the well being of our communities. We have to go beyond, well beyond that. So I started thinking, you know, Einstein, he said this quote, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So we got to really shift our thinking again. And so if we're really serious about decolonization, Leanne Simpson said this, she said, we have to do that within our indigenous frameworks of intelligence or so our original teachings and reinserting relationships, right? The relational way of thinking, but using the land. If, if settler colonialism is about taking away land and stealing land, then it's about reconnecting to the land because I am the land, the land is me, right? So that land-based healing is going to be part of us getting outside of our little service-oriented 50-minute sessions that we have inside of a box, inside of a building, right? Instead, we're getting out into the land, improves our neurotransmitters. Um, we become equal on the land, we're all children of Mother Earth, as my colleague, Dr. Michelle Johnson Jennings says, right? We, we are all equal out there on that land. You know, so we begin to shift our relational ways of being. And this is tied totally to even medicine people talk about this, right? You know, uh, I work with medicine man and my daughter had bad eczema when she was a young girl. He's like, you're too urban, that's the problem. He said, you know, I want you to just, the whole week you're out here on the land, I want you to be barefoot the whole time. And then he had her go and roll in mud and go into cold, there's some sacred waters where we're at, go into that cold sacred waters and get that dirt, that mud in her, got rid of her eczema. Now we know scientifically that works too, right? We know that dirt, those dirt, that dirt is actually important for us to be exposed to. So going back to the land has both physical health and, and, and mental health and spiritual health properties that are really important. So I'm gonna to move to the last part of my talk is, which is the fire element, you know, what are our responsibilities to our future generations? How do we transcend this historical trauma? So Dr. Michelle Johnson Jennings and I had a chance to work together to begin to do this in response to our tribe. Our tribe actually asked us, uh, asked me to step in and to deal with the diabetes problem that we've been, an obesity problem that we've been encountering. So by 2050, one out of three of our kids are expected to be living with type 2 diabetes. That is not the vision of love and life our ancestors held for our, our future generation. And we're dealing with you know, grandparents outliving their children. That makes no sense, right? So we knew something needed to happen. So we combined efforts um, with our tribe to, to, to address this. Um, and just to give you a background for those of you who aren't familiar with Choctaw Nation, this is, you, you see those lines where our, our green is our, where our territories were and then we moved over to that Southeastern part of Oklahoma that is now our reservation. It's bigger than the size of Massachusetts. So I have to remind people, <laughs> they, they, they always shrink us down, but I'm like, no, we're a, a fairly big land, land base. Um, and you can see that's where we started. That's where we ended up. We still have traditional names for our territory. And even it's divided by traditional leadership from uh, the, our ancestors. Um, and where you were from kind of tells you a lot about who your family was, 
uh, pre pre removal. So when they asked us to do this, they said, you know, hey, can can we get can we get moving on this? Is there a way we could do this? Um, and they wanted us to do originally kind of something through services, and that's when we said our tribe was doing everything right. They were putting in walkways. They were um, doing bariatric surgery. We have the best state of the art gyms. They're putting in walkways. They they changed uh, the menu for community gatherings, and I mean everything they were doing according to Western models correctly. Um, as a matter of fact, our gyms. I mean they're better than Gold's gym. I mean our gyms are beautiful, but only thirty percent of our tribe really uses them. There's still the seventy percent who don't go to services and aren't going to aren't accessing that. And I asked, I asked the leadership there, I said, what do you think is happening? And they said, well, there's a grief, there's something that's keeping people from connecting and we're not sure what it is, but now we know we need to do something differently. Can you come up with something? So Michelle, myself and um, Sharon Fleming, the chief sister, we put our heads together and we, we had, I mean, the answer came this quickly. I said, I need to go pray about it because an empirical lit review wasn't going to answer the question anymore. We already know we're doing things right by that, but we're moving less than 3% change in the tribe based on those those approaches. We need something a little bit more bold. So I said, let me pray about it. And I didn't even have to go very far in my prayer. It was so simple, the solution, which is my ancestors, all of our ancestors did not die on that trail of tears or walk that trail of tears uh, with this version of ourselves right now. This was not the vision of love and life they held for us and that we needed to reconnect to that vision of love and life. And we needed to correct and, and take uh, develop our own Choctaw health promotion model. And we decided the best way to do that was to rewalk the trail of tears ourselves um, and to take uh, health leadership and community volunteers to rewalk the trail. And uh, while being on that trail to come up and with an inspired, um, spiritually inspired, uh, basically, uh, talk to health promotion model. And, uh, and we wanted to flip the script. We're, we and you know because our we had to decolonize our tribe was like oh good you can take some youth and you can do suicide prevention and you could kind of talk about substance abuse prevention you could and we said no we're not going to talk about prevention what we're going to talk about is instead of suicide prevention what are our teachings about life and if we get out of balance how do we correct take corrective action instead of substance abuse we're going to talk about what are our teachings about medicines and if you abuse medicines what are the consequences and how do we do take corrective action it was a we had to rethink how we were going to approach each day on that trail. So they said, yeah, go ahead and do it. You've got you do it in the middle of the summer. Now, any of you who've been down to the States or are familiar with the area of Arkansas, walking in a very swampy region in the middle of summer was our first test that elders put us to. Are you serious? Are you really going to do this? Um, and so we agreed that 10 days would be a reasonable amount. We used GIS mapping and all of these all kinds of things to really find where the trails really were. Um, we didn't use what's on the internet. We actually use old military maps and a GI, a sophisticated GIS mapping and, and found uh, even intact parts of the route that we wanted to make sure we walked. We wanted to walk an average of eight to 10 miles a day, just like our ancestors did, um, and, um, and then uh, begin to, to pray and, and uh, work on identifying what our tactile health promotion is. Um, so we did two pilot studies basically doing this. This is my tribe, this is our land. Um, and you know, my it's, it's community-based participatory research. I mean, literally it's, it's, it's run by Choctaws, uh, researchers, it's unprecedented, working all with an all Choctaw team. Uh, so it was pretty amazing to have this opportunity. But our friend uh, Patricia Gonzalez said, you're not really doing community-based participatory research. She said, we're really doing ceremonially-based practice research, <laughs> which is kind of true. Um, and we started with a very simple question to begin this talk to health promotion model. What is the road to talk to health? What is the road? And that's us walking. So these are pictures from the trail. Uh, again, we did the GIS maps. Um, we did archival research in the Smithsonian. We held the commutation papers in our hand. We, we, I mean, we really did our research to find out what the vision of love and life our ancestors held for us. And uh, Chief Harkin said in a farewell letter to the American people in 1831, he said, Amid the gloom and horrors of the present separation, we are cheered with the hope that nothing short of the basis acts of treachery will ever be able to arrest it from us and that we may live free. So they, they, they wanted us to live free, be happy. So we started finding those stories. We created a curriculum and we did GIS blogging so people could follow us on, on the trail. We, we did digital stories afterwards. We journaled on the trail, which I would never do again. Um, but basically we followed our curriculum, we, we started. 
we had 13 Choctaw walkers, five native allies went with us and two white allies on the initial journey. Uh, we had four parent-child youth pairs. Um, we even we even had people document their dreams. As everything was, was part of the research process. Uh, we met with Choctaw elders, especially women elders, and uh, wanted Choctaw principles by which to engage our research in each other. Um, they gave us the importance of language and, and, and going into deeper meaning. We actually did ceremony uh, in preparation for the trail and on the trail to keep us in, in the right mind, right place. Um, uh, we were clear that, you know, knowledge is earned when the time is right and we might do all of this and get nothing other than a great, you know, a lot of blisters and a great experience bonding. But, you know, we were open to the, the fact that that traditionally that might happen and that's okay. Um, Here's some pictures from walking the trail uh, with our initial campment was uh, on our grounds. Um, here's some of the parent-child pairs. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was an amazing initial trip. Uh, we made a lot of uh, relational restoration and trail observations from this. So we did pre and post uh, interviews with everybody on the trail. Um, uh, you know, the young people said amazing things like, well, I heal myself. When I heal myself, I heal others. So they were, they were like really getting it. Um, uh, storing about the themes about restoring narrative transformation. Um, people restored their narratives. One said, still so there's a positive side that they made it through. There are times of joy. There are times of coming together and support and focusing on the positive. And this was important. Being out on the land and having this experience made us realize even our ancestors couldn't always stay in complete trauma state. They loved still even on the trail. And I realized that my uh, one of my great grandmothers was born uh, within months of being on that trail at Fort Tossum. Uh, so that meant they made love on that trail. Uh, so people were still doing what they needed to do to survive and, and be connected. Um, and so that gets that back to that holo, that love. And Michelle Johnson Jennings says, this is where we have to connect. We have to focus on the transmission of ancestral love. And that's where we begin to build our intervention. And so we did. And there's Michelle and I on one of our trips. We look so much younger there. Anyway, so um, we ended up out of this, be, we developed a culturally specific curriculum um, uh, guided by our ancient clan systems. We don't have these clans anymore, but the, the, the stories that we could find about the clans that built a health promotion model that started with the self and then moved to um, organizing at the community level. We decided to make this about building community health leaders. And it's not about fixing women, but rather, uh, and by the way, the community said we have to start with women. It was all women that volunteered to start this. And culturally that made sense because women are the ones, the elders said that's fine because the women are responsible for restoring the, the balance. And so it makes sense to them that women came forward. So we made it a women-focused uh, curriculum. And, and part of it was the, the focus on um, uh, helping them become community health leaders, getting prevention, intervention, um, training, and that they we gave them money and they held community events at the local level and the idea that these events would be sustainable. And the key thing that made a big difference for the women was uh, the kind of questions that we asked, which is, you know, we asked them through the curriculum, what kind of ancestor did my ancestors envision me to be? What kind of ancestor do I want to be? What kind of ancestors through my actions do I envision future generations to be? And so these, some of these women are still, they still have, um, they still have events going on to this day, uh, 10 years later, uh, or five years later since this project started. And so, uh, and now we've had the chance to extend it and build it for a youth program as well. Um, so I can say, I, I, I can't report on the results yet because I got to get tribal approval for that, but let's just say it went in the direction we were hoping to. So we were very excited about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's it. I'm going to end there and, and open it up for some questions. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I'm really, uh, hoping that, um, those of you online can uh, do some emojis so that we can see your um yeah i can see them <laughs> and uh please if you have any questions um put them in the chat we also i'm joined by alex lucky and jennifer williams who might uh do some fielding of questions if you have any or i don't know if they have any more i just i i learned so much and i really want to um just begin by just thanking you for you know opening my eyes <laughs> to so much. Um, and it was uh, 
I don't know, it was extraordinary. I, I ended up stopping, I was tweeting a lot and then I stopped because I wanted to listen more because there was a couple of things uh, that I missed that, and it doesn't, um, it, it's, uh, um, while I'm waiting for anybody, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Oh yeah, we've got somebody that's gonna interrupt me because I was gonna say something about the matriarchy to the patriarchy, but, but <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that wasn't lost on me. I was definitely paying attention to that part. Um, uh, Aya, did you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, um, I'd love to hear what you had to say about the patriarchy and matriarchy, but um, my question, is for uh like when we're navigating trying to reconnect to the land i guess um if anybody has advice on how to avoid being overwhelmed because i know in my field of work i um mm -hmm. am a psychology uh major and i try so hard to stay away from behavioral health but it's so much overwhelming like the approach and um sometimes i just uh, have a hard time, like navigating both the transformations that I'm trying to make on a personal level and then bringing it back to the land. Um, when it comes to like real estate and legislation, um, I feel really quickly, like I don't know where to start. Well, I could tell you, I mean, for the women, when we first started, uh, on the land, one of the first things we said is that we're focused on the love our ancestors carried and we're not gonna, if the tears will come or the, the cleansing that needs to happen because tears happen for, it's, it's, a, a, it's a spiritual and healthy way our body and mind, body, spirit cleanses itself. So it's important to have tears, but not get lost in the tears. And, um, and so we, we recognized that early on and, and made sure we, we made that a point to focus on that and, uh, you know, in terms of the behavioral health, I mean, I think that, you know, land-based healing is behavioral health. We could do that, but that's not, it doesn't, the division doesn't have to be there. And there's work that we're doing, both Michelle Johnson Jennings and myself and, and Tess Evans Campbell as well, who's got a program uh, as well called uh, uh, Trans Journey of Transformation. So we're, we're working with a lot of our groups, connecting back to the land and back, back to our original teachings. Um, but I, don't, I think it's a false dichotomy if we think that the, oh, we do a land-based intervention over here and then we should do behavioral health over here. I think there's a reason it's important to begin to combine them. You can learn from both yeah. approaches, yeah, yeah. obviously. I really love that um, analogy about, you know, oh, so you, your mom had the naming ceremony and you're, you're <laughs> really, that was really, it was really helpful, I think, for, uh, and I, I also really love the crab in a bucket. <laughs> right I, yeah that, that makes a lot of sense and it's that reframing and that that um rethinking that is just so important to the whole um mm -hmm. healing process it was but you know really fantastic to to listen to i could listen to you actually for way longer than, <laughs> well, than, um, i hope i didn't speak too fast but i, I no, try to get a lot in there you, you, I mean, I was trying to, uh, like, get, I mean, no, no, I was totally great. It was perfect. Um, uh, Aya, did you, yeah, you got your hand raised, your hand, go ahead. Yeah, um, sorry, I hope I'm not asking too many questions. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I was thinking, you know, as hearing hearing everything, it was so helpful. Um, I, I definitely agree that there shouldn't be a division of things. Um, you mentioned the organization, uh, that you're working on was called, um, what was the name of it? Well, we're the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of Washington, iwri.org. If you go there, okay. you can, can read about uh, all of our projects. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that sounds awesome because I'm kind of was realizing another problem that um, I guess I am coming into, not a problem, but like a roadblock I feel is um, getting other people to kind of understand where I'm coming from when it, um, you know, when I'm, trying to maybe suggest things like uh getting outside more and uh not worrying about paperwork so much and um i think finding the right organizations and the right people might be like a much better start um but that is a problem i've had of trying to you know uh 
like people say, fight the system from within it. And it's like, yeah, get in the bucket so you can push everyone out. Like <laughs> as though that's going to work. You, you need both. You need both the people on the inside and people on the outside. So <laughs> you need them both. I think partly what I'm trying to say is whatever system you work in, you have the opportunity to, to free your mind mm -hmm. and begin to approach this differently. Mm -hmm. And I think too often we think we accept our systems as being immalleable and I don't think I think there's more room than we give ourselves permission to explore mm -hmm. and I think uh, we're of course out of time um thank you <laughs> of course it always would be out of but I uh just um wanted to say something that now has gone out of my head but I think the other thing that I have learned that I think is really appropriate here is listen to listen to people right so listen to different ways of doing things and um because you can learn so much like so you you gave us a lot of really great um uh pieces and I like I wrote them all down but and I, I really wanted to learn more about the narrative transformation but that's for the next talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah we just think about that original instructions relational restoring relational ways of being and transforming how we story our lives and it's important from our communities to have the uh, invoke that power to be able to story our lives it's really critical no, it's, it's, thank it's you really for having amazing. me thank you for so much uh, your work and there's more uh comments there so i'll definitely send them to you because i don't okay. know if i have that time and i'm cognizant of time so so sorry um, thank you everybody i really you appreciate so it